Welcome to another episode of Ingrid's World. Well, hold on to your seats because I'm going to introduce you to people who are making a difference. You will meet the former Secretary of Education for the state of Virginia. He has some very clear ideas about lessons learned and things that we need to move towards for our education. We will welcome back to the show our fitness guru. He will reinforce the importance of exercise. Our last guest will bring music to your heart. His organization conducts after-school music programs for youth and young adults. Yes, people making a difference. Don't you love it? Now let's welcome to the show Colonel Wilbert Bryan, who has served in several positions since retiring from the Army, including Virginia's Secretary of Education, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Education, U.S. Department of Education, and Counselor to the Secretary for the White House Initiative on Historical Black Colleges and Universities. Colonel Bryan is the recipient of numerous awards, including seven honorary degrees, doctorates. Thank you so much for being on the show. It's a privilege having you here. I'm happy to be here. Well, I talked a little bit about <clears throat> your career, but I really wanted to talk a little bit about some of the highlights that you see. What were some of the positions that you've actually loved in, in your wonderful career? Well, the very first, uh, after leaving the military, and of course that was a great and illustrious career of 28 years, but the first was when I was a vice president for student affairs at a university down in Richmond. That's really what got me on track and got me uh, all energized to go into the field of education. I did that for three and a half years. And then, as you stated earlier, I joined one of the governor's administration to become the deputy secretary of education with primary emphasis on K-12 mm -hmm. education. Did that for four years. And then when the next governor ran, I became the uh, secretary of education with the 37 educational institutions. Uh, 16 public colleges and universities in the Commonwealth, um, five state museums, the State Library of Virginia, the two, med or two teaching hospitals, Medical College of Virginia, the University of Virginia's hospital, about a $17 billion biennial budget. So it was very, very challenging to do that job. So I held that job for four years, four years. one month short of four years. That was perhaps the most interesting period uh, to kick things off mm -hmm, in education, mm -hmm, being mm -hmm, Secretary mm -hmm. of Education, mm -hmm. having the responsibility for 1.1 million public school children, then the 16 public colleges and universities, and having an opportunity to interact with those university president, boards of trustees, and students at those institutions. Ah, and I know you saw so many different examples of education, the best and the brightest, and many things. What are some of the lessons that you were learning through that? Well, the key thing that I learned is that every child is capable of learning. I love it. And the key to that is strong parental support. Mm. The problems that we're having in the country today, All right. people are talking about throwing more money yes. at these problems. Money is not the issue. The problem is right in the home, mm. a lack of parental guidance. And I have many examples of that. If you look at my background and where I came from, a single parent uh, raised seven children. All of us went to college, minus one. We lost one. But they all did very well. Mm -hmm. A valedictorian, number four, the second child, yours truly, number 11. All of us graduated in four years, was in five or six years. And we're talking about being in science, the two oldest being in science, I'm in math. Uh, what it takes is a dedicated parent who not only just go out on back to school night, but who check homework mm. and make sure that that child is truly learning what is being taught in that school. And I think that's one of the reasons the governor chose me to be a secretary of education because he knew I had a military background, uh, having graduated from the highest level of schooling in the Defense Department, the National War College. War College. Wow. And then traveling all over the world, to Africa, uh, Asia, you name it, I've been there. And that's an education in itself. So I took my children with me uh, because that's an education, because the things that they're learning in the classroom, it's reinforced when they travel to places like Athens, Greece, or to Madrid, Spain, or to Lisbon, Portugal. 
they learn. They learn. Oh my goodness. And I love how you, you, you first talk about you know, your roots in terms of having that single parent. Mm -hmm. And that's what we, you know, this show will be watched by, uh, by the parents and, and some of them are coming, you know, are single parents raising mm -hmm. that child. So your words to them, what were some of the things that you saw your mother do that well, really? Well, you know, ideally it's wonderful to have two parents. Absolutely. But two parents are not necessary. Like I said, I grew up with one parent. A father not to give me one dime, mm. but that mother to give me that unconditional love and checking to make sure that I knew my timetables. It was stair step and she didn't play. We had to do it. And I wanted to leave South Florida because I didn't want to work in that hot sun. She told us if you get a good education, you can wear a coat and tie to work. And we believe her and she told the truth. So when I left college, got married, and by the way, we just celebrated our 50th wedding anniversary back in December. Oh we God. raised two children, and both mm -hmm. children graduated from college. And like I said, we didn't just go out and visit back to school night. We checked homework, we checked them to make sure that they were truly learning what was being taught in the classroom. We touched base with the teachers to find out what is in the curriculum for the ensuing school year. That's the role of a parent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Money is not the issue. Okay. The issue is the child, the parent. Mm -hmm. Is that child properly motivated when he or she leaves home to go away to school? Mm -hmm. One of the negatives of children today mm -hmm. in the world that we're living mm -hmm. in today, mm -hmm. they don't realize that we're living in a global society. Yes, speak about that. All, we're competing with people from all over the world, yes. all around the world. Yes. But so many of our young people are caught up with the technology that we have, and they live on these smartphones, um, emails, uh, text messages. Uh, they can't get away from it. They're addicted to it. Yes. If parents only took those devices, took them away from the children, do your homework first, and then you can get on those devices. That's the key. Hey, we have some of the finest teachers in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And being Secretary of Education, I had an opportunity to travel all around Virginia to meet a lot of those educators. But the parents make the difference in the lives of those children. We have the best teachers here, and I have to agree with you. We do have the best teachers here in the state of Virginia. Absolutely. That's, oh, without question. And as you may recall, when we came into office, we implemented Virginia's standards of learning. Yes. Where we raised yes. the bar. Yes. Because we believe that every child was capable of being successful and succeeding. And I'm sure you can take a look at the statistics, the test results. Our young people are doing well. They're excelling in education. Excelling. Take a look at the Thomas Jefferson Science School of Science and Technology. All of the schools here in the Fairfax area, these are some of the finest, not only in Virginia, but these are some of the finest schools in the world, in the world. right here in Fairfax County. And I think I can pretty much say that for all of the schools uh, throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. Yes. And then being in the Bush administration after leaving Virginia, I had an opportunity at that level to travel around the country mm -hmm. to visit colleges and universities mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. we gave grant dollars mm -hmm. to colleges and universities to help them uh, educate their young people. Wow. And as a result, um, wow. I could look back at Virginia I could look back at places like North Carolina and I could see mm -hmm. what was being done mm -hmm. by those outstanding teachers mm -hmm. by putting these young people into the pipeline and many of them graduating in four years and of course a lot of them moving out in five years. I love that. You know, you, you're giving really a clear message. You know, it's not money. Nope. Sounds like you're saying it's time and attention. Absolutely. Ah. That's exactly what it is. My undergraduate degree is in mathematics. And when I went to school, my mom told me, you only have four years. And so I knew that every day when I went to class, in my major, I was gonna have a 10 minute quiz or a 15 minute quiz. So I worked every night, I worked problems. I learned theorems because I listened to my mom. Parental influence is absolutely essential for a child to be successful, whether it's at the high school level or at the college level. Even when my children went away to college, I went to the university to check on them, 
to make sure that they were doing what they were supposed to do. Hand in hand. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. My son changed his major and I gave him an extra year to graduate. He graduated in that year. My daughter graduated with honors from Princeton University, an Ivy League institution. Didn't have to worry about it. We never worried about them because we raised the bar. Uh -huh. I showed them my grades. I said, beat that. <laughs> and I, I challenged them to do that. So we had a lot of fun in our family. And every family can do the same thing. Ideally, two parents, we'd love to have that. But if you don't have two parents, one parent can get the job or a caring adult in that household. And I love that what you're saying, or a caring adult. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. To check that child, to let that child know, hey, education is the most important thing that you can do. This is going to set your asthma for life. Mm -hmm. Once you walk out of those hollowed walls, whether it's high school or college, you're prepared for the world. I love what you're saying. You are inspiring me, and you've certainly inspired me, and hopefully our viewers to get involved. And if your children have already been raised, reach out. Absolutely. You know, be that caring adult. And I do a lot of volunteer work right now, uh, sitting on uh, scholarship panels, selecting young people, or talking to parents and students about how to get funds mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. stay in school. And I know some of the parents are challenged, but there are dollars out there if they're willing to work hard to get those dollars. And once you get there and you get those dollars, you have to make sure that you perform. You're inspiring. Well, Colonel Bryant, thank you so much. It's thank you for having have me. You here. Glad to be here. Our next guest will be Corey Scoggin, President and CEO of Fitness Forever Incorporated. Corey uses over 30 years of experience in health and fitness industry to plan effective fitness programs. Let's welcome to the show, Corey Scoggin. Welcome to the show, Corey. It's wonderful to have you back. Uh, thank you for having me. Well, for those viewers that did not see the first show that you were on, I like to say the first show uh, episode of Ingrid's World, let's talk about first what you do and how did you get involved in fitness? Okay. Well, I've been a professional fitness trainer now for 30 years and um, started in the military. And uh, one of my commanders asked me if um, I would be interested in being a a base fitness coordinator and I said sure. So that's how everything started. Once I got out of the military then I worked at the uh, Department of Labor as a fitness specialist there and then I started my company Fitness Forever back in 1996 and I've been moving forward since then. 1996? Congratulations! Yes. That's wonderful. So in this whole era of you know staying fit you know what are some of the things that we need to be thinking about and why is it so important to you know for exercise? Well it's important because the important thing is setting realistic goals first. Mm. Uh, many of us when we set goals we set goals that are so astronomical that they are not within what I would call the wheelhouse of our common sense. So when one sets realistic goals and they have to understand number one what their body type is like. They have to understand their nutritional value. Mm -hmm. They also have to understand what their medical as well as physical background is because there may be some exercises that are good for one but might not be good for another individual. Ah, huh, now that makes sense. So just because everyone's out there running on the treadmill doesn't mean to say that I should be out there running on the treadmill. No, you may need to just walk on a treadmill right, or like walk that. in place. A yes. <laughs> walk in place. Uh, how do you come to this evaluation that you know what's good for you? How well, do you figure that well, out? you have to find a professional who understands what his or her um, educational background is in reference to fitness. Oh. So the way I, when I work with people, the things that I always ask is what are your short-term goals? What is it that you're looking to achieve in three to five months or three to six months? What are your long-term goals? How do you see yourself being one to two years from now once we have set out a usable and workable program for you? Once we have mm -hmm. done that, then we will start uh, putting together exercises that are doable as well as what are important for your strength level. We all have certain strength levels. Um, it may be important to, as you can see these uh, exercise balls okay. right here, it may not always mean that you have to start with something heavy, but something that is manageable for you. So in using the exercise balls, they are good as far as for gripping, but also they're good as far as using your full range of motion. Ah, 
So, all right, so I don't have to start out with like the 10 and 20 pound weights, mm -hmm. but I can start small. You can start, these are three pound balls. So you can take one okay. right here. All right. And they're very good because you can use as far as a full dexterity of your hands by gripping them. And it may not even mean that you have to use both of them. You can start off with just a basic curl okay. like so, or even up and down a shoulder okay. press or individual bicep ah, curl. So there are many it. ways of being able to use the exercise balls that can help you as far as reaching your potential. Wow, and I love the whole, you wouldn't think that this, it looks light, but mm -hmm. it's actually three pounds. Oh my goodness. All right, and so this really, really increases your strength. How, how many times would you have to do something like this? I always recommend that one does strength training at least three to five days a week to start off. Okay. Um, it's important that you always warm up first. You do your stretches. A warm up okay. can be anything from marching in place to walking on a treadmill, oh. an elliptical, any type of nonstop rhythmic movement for at least three to five minutes. Okay. From there, then that's where it's important to start doing some strength training. Mm -hmm. The beauty about exercise is that it's supposed to prepare you for everyday life demands, which means that no matter what you may have to deal with throughout the course of the day, hopefully your fitness program have prepared you for it. Many people may have goals and may say, okay, yes, I want to uh, lose X amount of pounds. I want to be able to run fast, walk fast. I want to be able to get into a particular type of outfit. But if you really understand your body, then you will understand that exercise will prepare you, hopefully, for no matter what you may have to go through throughout the course of the day. You never know. Your car may stall and you may have to walk five or ten miles. Okay. There you go. Uh, you never know. You may have to defend yourself. And when you look at it uh, around the holiday season, when you have a lot of people who are being attacked uh, in parking garages, you never know what may happen. So hopefully your fitness program has prepared you right. for self-defense, for walking. You may have to even be able to help a loved one or be able to move uh, something heavy from a loved one. Uh, in fact, if you look at the news, you see there's just a landslide a couple of days ago. Uh, in uh, Washington, in the state of Washington, and a lot of people lost their lives. You never know, you may have to be able to walk or climb or, or pull yourself out of a certain situation. Wow. So you're saying always, because you, you, never, you never know when you're going to be called to, that you need to have strength. You never know. Oh my goodness. But I if about you that. put yourself in the position to always think successful, your exercise program will work for you. Okay. So it's not just, as you mentioned, like the particular outfit or, in my case, I mm -hmm. have an event that I want to go mm -hmm. to and I want to look my best or a reunion. But it's about that everyday activity, you know, hey, parking my car and knowing that it's being parked really far away, mm -hmm. I'm going to have to walk to where I need to get there and it's not a big deal. That's true. And just look what just happened uh, recently. We've had so much snow over the past two to three months. You have so many people who are having heart attacks from shoveling snow. All right. Okay. But has your fitness program prepared you for that? There are people who go out and shovel snow every day and they don't even warm up. They don't stretch. Wow. Uh, I'm at the uh, good age, I would say, of 50. I'll be 51. Uh, wow, in May. Congratulations. You I'll, never know that. Thank I, you. I saw you in the studio. I'm like, who's this kid? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And uh, I always, before I shovel snow, I always warm up. I always oh. stretch. I always do some type of movement that will prepare my body. So this show um, is going to be uh, in May. And actually, June is when we're going to be doing this, and hopefully, po people will, you know, think about some of the things that you're saying. Yes, you know, snow, but hopefully, in this, when this show is aired in the month of June, they'll be out there gardening and exercising. So, what can they do while they're out there? What's your last words about what we need to get involved in? Always warm up. Always stretch before uh, you do any type of movement. Anything. anything. Okay. Our best teachers are animals. If you watch a cat or a dog, the first thing that they do before they move, stretch. they stretch. They stretch. All right. Okay, that's what we have to remember. We're gonna have to always stretch. I like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it's okay like when you get out of bed, usually like I like to stretch all the way up and like that, that's good. Yeah. It's okay to stretch, it's okay to move, but you also want to make sure that you're taking deep breaths. Uh, uh -huh. Many people do not understand the true essence of breathing. When we breathe, if I were to say, Ingrid, take a deep breath, 
you would probably breathe from here, the chest, but our rib cage is there to protect our lungs and our heart. But if you learn to breathe from mm -hmm. your stomach, then you'll get more oxygen and air into the system. Okay, well, I think that's great words to end this segment on. Breathe, stretch, and, um, and keep watching this episode again because we'll, you'll get more tips and it really will get embedded into what you need to do to stay fit. Thank, Thank you, Thank you for Ingrid. being on the show. It's my pleasure. Our next guest I want you to meet is Skip Chappells, president of Music for Life. Let's welcome to the show Skip Chappells. Welcome, Skip. So pleasure to have you here. Thank you for the invitation. Well, I was excited to, uh, to have you on the show. I remember meeting you at a particular project that we were working on, and I got excited about some of the work that you're doing. Well, first, let's introduce yourself. Um, tell us a little bit about you know about you. Well, I was born and raised in New Hampshire. I professional job, I was an engineer. I started as an electrical engineer. I have 32 years experience as a defense contractor. Mm -hmm. The last 12 years of that I formed and ran my own company. Wow. I've been involved with youth programs for 35 years. Wow. I have been the scout master of our community Boy Scout troops since 1979. Beautiful. I have been involved with after school music programs since 2006 and I'm the treasurer of our Civic Association since 2000, where I also participate in Fairfax County Task Force on Youth Issues. It sounds like you are leading a life of service. Yes. Oh, and <laughs> that's a wonderful thing. Um, music for Life, tell us a little bit. First, why did you found such an organization like that? Well, Music for Life is a prevention program. It's to try and give opportunity and guidance to youth who needed. Mm -hmm. okay. we, were, uh, we got involved with this back in 2006 when a teenage neighbor of mine was shot and killed. Uh -huh. uh, myself and some other friends in the neighborhood who had children who had grown up with this boy uh, wanted something positive to come from the experience. He was an Eagle Scout from my Boy Scout troop, an avid guitar player and studying music at Nova at the time. His parents found an after-school music program on the web to memorize him, to memorialize him by. Mm -hmm. uh, it was in California. Mm -hmm. We contacted them, brought a chapter here to Virginia, and started. Over the years, we developed and, and grew to meet the local needs here, and we exceeded what their interests were, so we formed Music for Life and continue on as a local nonprofit serving the metropolitan D.C. area. Oh my goodness. So what are some of the activities that you have going on for Music for Life? Well, we, we run a daily or weekly program for kids throughout the school year. Okay. Uh, we provide them all the equipment. Our program is totally free to them. We go out into the communities where our kids live mm. and provide in their own environment an after-school music program where they can participate. Uh, mostly we teach guitar. When a child learns how to play that guitar, we award it to them to keep. It's theirs. So they, they can continue the on with doing it. Yes. Oh my goodness, that means a lot. Yes. Oh, and, uh, and, how, and how old are the children when they first are starting? We serve kids in middle and high school mm. age kids. Nice. Um, you know, the children today, when you're in the early education years, you get a lot of information and they really get a clear vision of the possibilities in life. Mm -hmm. But when they start getting into middle and high school and they see the barriers that get in front of them, if you come from a difficult background, whether it be from poverty or homelessness or substance abuse in the family or you live in a neighborhood that has prevalent gang activity or so forth, and those barriers look insurmountable and they give up. We go into those communities and actually set up a positive educational program where these children can get involved with something constructive, mm. doing something social. Okay. I mean, research has shown that music education uh, helps people more than just about any other single activity. It, children who are involved in quality music pro programs tend to do better in school. They okay. score higher on average on standardized tests. They develop socially better. Oh my goodness. And music programs are 
for anyone. There are no uh, stereotypes based on your religion, your race, your national origin, mm -hmm. your physical mm -hmm. attributes. Mm -hmm. Anyone can do this. That's very important in today's diverse society to have a program that any kid can get together with other kids mm. and share the interest. And music is like that bridge that you know, gets people together. Exactly. You don't even have to speak the same language, huh? Yes. You don't know, just hear that beautiful music and the <laughs> guitar. I'm partial to guitar because I have a son that plays guitar and I know what you're saying. He just would light up every time he heard that guitar. Oh my goodness. What is, so you're, you're doing that, you're in how many, are you in schools, in, in any of our schools and community centers? We're community based, not school based for the most part. Ah, oh, nice. We want to go, the, the two biggest obstacles to, to youth are in difficult circumstances are finances mm -hmm. and transportation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. These children either can't afford the equipment fees or, or equipment they need to participate in a lot of activities, or they come from families that don't have the transportation options yes. to get them to activities that occur at non-school times. Okay. Or they don't have parents necessarily that have themselves have the educational background mm. to support their child, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or they don't have the experience with the American culture. Mm, to understand either. how to direct their child through our society. So it's not really a question of the parent being a good parent and a loving parent wanting yeah. to help their child. The reality is they're not in a position to do it themselves. Wow. And you need someone else to come in and mentor and give those examples and opportunity. I, I love what you're saying. So for, as a final thought, how can they find you? They can find us on our website, right. musicforlife.org. Excellent. It's a great place to go. Uh, it has all our contact information and describes our program. Excellent. Uh, they can find us. We are a member of United Way. Wonderful. We're in combined federal campaign. We're in the World Bank Community Connections campaigns. They can find us through those or organizations. Through June and the summer months and the early fall, you will find us with a booth set up at most of the area uh, music festivals. Ah, oh, the music festivals. We're there, Love it. and we'll be set up, passing out information and pass telling about our program. And sometimes we bring guitars and teach the kids. And in June, uh, we'll be part of United Way's Do More 24 Do Day, more. which is going to be out there trying to get all of the communities to come together on one day to support nonprofit organizations in their community. So there's lots of ways you can lots find of us. Ways We're very it. visible. Well, it's a pleasure having you on the show, and I hope people listening to this show will either get involved to help support your organization or to get their children involved. Well, we are an all-volunteer organization. Ah, love it. So we need musicians to help teach classes. We need non-musicians to help us set up and oversee classes. So lots of opportunities for everyone. I love it. To live a life like Skip, a <laughs> life of service. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank all of our guests for coming on the show. It was an honor to feature all of your work and your contributions to the community. I leave you with this quote from President Barack Obama. That is the American story. People just like you, following their passion, determined to meet the times on their own terms. They weren't doing it for money. Their titles weren't fancy but they change the course of history, and so can you. Thank you, President Barack Obama, for your quote. Like us on Facebook for instant Ingrid's World News, or see ingridsworld.org, and I thank you for watching.